Treeborn is vending machine part two, boy, let's get it. The quick thinking quadrilateral eases his fall by excreting balloons and becoming cardboard. Unfortunately, he falls into a labyrinth. Boxo isn't too upset though, and takes some pictures on the way down. That cool coin from earlier reminds him about his fight with the lizard lord. He finds out that killing enemies gives you isekai points, but decides to continue his business focused lifestyle. Boxo uses the vague definition of vending machine to slurp up his boss coin. It doesn't do anything. Lame. He glows red briefly. It's no biggie though. Boxo, much like a lizard regulating its body temperature in the sun, has evolved to power his robo body with solar energy. A pack of furries are being chased by a few potatoes. Boxo gallantly throws his milk, saving the dogs. They wander back for some reason and are beset upon Bosco. He is pleased. Communication attempts were unsuccessful. The wildlife is ultimately seduced by the wafting scent of street food. In the space of a few seconds, they manage to tell Boxo all of their personal credit card information through natural conversation. Impressive. The dog's pockets are pilfered. Do dogs have pockets? Boxo finds out that the pack are hunters that call themselves the voracious eaters. The eaters are lost, but are chuffed by their find. Boxo asserts his dominance by speaking, sort of. They almost figure out he is sentient. The little dogs are too small to transport Boxo, so he equips his sick wheels. He terrifies them with his blue cube shortly after. Communication attempts were unsuccessful. He resorts to textual marketing to promote his product, but dogs are illiterate it, as we now know. The voracious eaters conclude that Boxo has rejected them. He makes amends by giving them more food. The potatoes are back. Boxo attempts to incinerate them, but ends up greasing all over. Big 100 foot tall conflagrant skeleton was lonely and wanted friends. He tries to speak, but his mongo fireballs just scorch everything in their path. May as well make use of these, I guess. The poor Colosso skeleton sulks off into the distance. Boxo watches intently over his clutch of fuzzy eggs. When the eaters almost become the eaten by the flame skeleton's weird relatives, Boxo and the little guys throw their juice and kill the enemy. The gray one almost figures out that Boxo is an existent creature. Their superb hearing detects the sound of battle. It's Lamis and her rippling muscles. Everyone else is here too. Boxo is pleased. They converse. Bear guy thanks the youngins for their service, they find out Boxo is sentient. The gluttons lie slain. The bear explains that they want to kill Big Skeleton. Cartography explains that everyone in the menagerie is after the dungeon's heart. It is said that when one conquers the dungeon, they can exchange Stratum Lord coins for a wish. Boxo envisions himself as a supermarket in response. The adventurer suggests that he become a human since he already has a soul. He says something along the lines of, I'll give it some thought. Boxo reveals he has already obtained a coin and is invited to join the menagerie of fools officially. Bago, Hewlert, and Limbus accept. They sleep. Boxo contemplates what it would be like to feel warmth. Same. The next day he shows them his nudes. They are fascinated. Filmina does a sneaky copy paste. Bear discusses strategy. It is to make big hole and have big skeleton fall in hole. That's a nice hole. Carpool has a genius plan to pee on the skeleton afterwards. Boxo is thrilled and turns into a power washer. They moisten the ground. It wasn't very effective. Boxo uses an ice attack instead. Lamis flirts with him. Boxo contemplates his existence as a vending machine and decides that he has more self-confidence as a vending machine rather than as a human. He isn't sure if he wants to be a man or a machine. Big Skeleton heard there was a gathering of potential friends and wanted to see if maybe they could hang out. He tries to do a party trick to break the ice, but fails. It turns out that Boxo used dry ice, which is condensed CO2. It's heavier than oxygen, so no oxygen, no fire. Skeleton is excited that he is no longer a walking crematorium and can finally make friends without fear. They only throw rocks and call him names, though. They discuss throwing Boxo as well, but decide it's probably inhumane to do so at this point. The only option they have other than that is to go in there and beat the big guy with sticks. Boxo struggles to explain that CO2 is deadly to humans and big skeletons. He flirts in frustration. Lamis rejects his advances, and Boxo is sent into the chasm. I feel bad for Skeletor, he just wanted to make friends. Boxo steals the loot and gracefully ascends like that of a dove through a chapel's bell tower. Lamis is lampiste. Boxo tries to distribute the loot, but Hulami has more DKP and snatches the coin from Carlisle. Cornhole bribes Boscow into handing over the dough. They head back to the town, probably. 
The adventurers spot a scruffy looking village and discuss the local population. The hunter's lodge is especially desolate. The bear's name is Bami, which makes sense. They sleep. Apparently Boxo can sleep too. The next day, a hot guy named Mishul struts in and accidentally flirts with everyone. He is nervous and flees in panic. Ulami astrally projects into a burly man. They discuss the chronicles of ancient heroes. Sleep. Handsome fella is distressed. He has social anxiety and thought this place was relatively immature. He doesn't know he is sexy because he's an autistic mama's boy. Same. Boxo calms him down with drugs. Same. The next day, Mishul joins the Box Brigade on a reconnaissance mission. Michelin is assailed by praise from the caravan. He flees in shame. Get that man some benzodiazepines. Michael and Box Bro chill out by the fire. A whole week passes. Lamis has got girl cramps. Boxo is confused but figures it out. Washing machine. Another week passes. Mishul isn't terrified by everything one anymore and discusses Boxo with the girls. The dog's keen noses sniff out a trap. Mishul reveals that people are after him. Lemis doesn't care. Boxo proves his prowess with a duel to get Michelle to accept his power. The ambushers make contact. Negotiations are quick, and they begin their battle. Boxo pees on the enemy, going for the eyes. Mishul obliterates his aggressors and sends for the wagon. He apologizes for the inconvenience, explaining that he should probably leave now. Lamis attempts to recruit him into the menagerie of fools. He is nervous about meeting new people. The Council of Domination deliberates. Their leader proposes that they hold an eating contest as a marketing strategy. Everyone is cool with it. The notorious eaters are entering the council's competition. The chefs wail in agony over their assured loss of profits. Boxo solves their issue with cola. Bubbly stuff is filling, I guess. The culinarians prostrate themselves in respect. It's bustling, bro. The reward for victory is some kind of mystery box. They, are attention. they eat of the nuggets. There is a brief halftime performance that happens off camera. Boxo plays his ancestral music and hypes the crowd for the finale. They eat of the nuggets. They eat of the crepes. The little girl named Shui wins and gets to use Boxo free for a day. Boxo is not pleased at first, but doesn't mind after giving it some thought. Chewie deflects Captain Creel's attempts at gaslighting and decides to visit the origin stratum. It's just a cave. Never mind, it's a cave full of orphans. There's an old lady. Boxo dutifully feeds them all. He is pleased and pees all over the cave urchins in the light. Disaster strikes. There's no hot water for the bath. It is treason. The small perpetrators will be flayed and eaten alive afterwards. Boxo becomes a hot spring in response. He is peaked as a Japanese vintage machine. Boppo has self-doubts, but Lattice gives him confidence. They sleep. Gooey thanks Boxo for his help with the orphans. He produces a juice to objectify his feelings. Chewie explains that people leave their darn kids in this here cave because it's the beginning of the dungeon. She flees from embarrassment for some reason. Some criminals scuttle through the darkness in search of Boxo. He turns into a haunted house and spooks off the narrow wells, much like a hunter recording the size of his prey. So too does Boxo pose with his quarry. Lamis states that those are just small fry, and it's good that Boxo set them free. Don't want to disturb nature's delicate balance. The old lady disagrees and goes to feel justice's tender caress. That woman is dangerous. Lamis screams in absolute terror. Their next mission is to wander around in a haunted stratum. She clings to Costco. Charcuterie gaslights Lamis into going anyway. This place puts the hebes in the jeebies. Lamis goes in fear. A hot goth babe emerges from the shadows. It's super effective. Lapras faints. Boxo boxes in preparation for normie transport. Ulami reminisces about Lamis's past cowardice. An assortment of freaky fiddle Faddle starts manifesting at nighttime. Boxo stereotypes the undead by launching a bunch of junk at them. The spooky woman eats her hair in front of Boxo and explains that the boogies from last night don't like the living, so they prowl around looking for life forms to maim. Lamis is depressed. Hugert cheers her up with psychological intervention. She tries exposure therapy. It doesn't work. She tries again with Boxo this time. He admires her perseverance and expels the smell of coffee to some jazz. Lamis is inspired. Prairie Soil brought friends to help with whatever it is they're doing. Miso looks composed. Cariole explains that they are going to kill the Stratum Lord. 
Everyone seems fine with this and they head out. Their wagon is ambushed by the undead, which are easily dispatched. That night, Boxo is breathed on by a little dead guy. The zombie gyrates some juice out of Boxo, but doesn't really know what to do with it. He returns nocturnally to nibble on more of the bottles. If you're gonna feed him anything, just give him something with nutrients, like a live bird or a, or a squirrel or something. Boxo catches feelings. Out in the wilderness, the child returns for his plastic, but is turned into ash because he probably doesn't have a soul. Boxo grieves. They find a singular coin where the corpse used to be, implying that he was trying to pay for that stuff. Maybe he did have a soul? Now cracks a noble heart. Good night, sweet prince. And may flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. The menagerie of fools discusses the soul king's location. He should be on Luffy's ship, but I guess not. They discuss strategy. Congo wants to use Boxo's blue cube to bum rush the dead wizard. They revel in the flawlessness of his plan. It is the day of battle. In the confederacy of quadrilaterals approach their mark, the Soul King has a veritable army at his command. Boxo introduces gasoline to the medieval plebs. It is immediately weaponized, incinerating the ghouls. Skeletor pounds Boxo's Aegis with his lightning move, is shook. He earthbends the ground into a labyrinth and compliments Boxo. The king blows some wind, but Lemus holds strong. He goes for a follow-up by tossing Lemoxo into a hole. It has no effect on Lemus though. Shui interrupts his cast with her counter shot. Lamis kicks the disoriented wizard's head off. They rejoice. It's not over. A bigger lord throws his purple orb, incapacitating everyone except the strongest. He slurps up some of that gunk and reforms into a spiky skeleton. He comments on Boxo's true nature, that of a reincarnated human being, then tosses his little cousin's coin around. He monologues. Michelle pulls a sneaky, but is flapped with Mr. Box Skeleton's spaghetti tail. The hunters grease up that funky freak and teach him about weaponized dinosaur goop. Escape is futile. A couple of the girls get snatched up by Giga Skeleton Scrubby Grabbers. I'm, I'm not gonna lie to you, things aren't looking too great here. The women are kill. No. Lupus has a mental breakdown and goes nuts. She is repelled. Boxo ideates furiously. He deflects the wraith's cone of bees. Boxo turns into a cardboard and starts making balloons. He flings Lamis with all his might, who flying axe kicks the bone lord's hand off, causing him to turn into bees and slink into the night. Lamis and Captain start fondling the dead little girls. Boxo confuses them by turning into a defibrillator. He can use telekinesis now, which is pretty sweet. Dr. Boxo receives necessitates the women. They have a pity party back at base and decide to contact Brother Bear about this dirty deviant. Back at the OG village, Bommy Bear informs the champions about the now named Netherlord. The tomes of yore indicate that he may be a general of the Demon Lord's army. Lamis is ruthlessly assaulted by her friend once more. The adventurers are pretty much local legends now. Boxo is humble. Slurry is mean and uses her baguettes like propellers to make a hasty exit. Mishul is sulking. The band of gluttons inspire him, then tell him that reinforcements are coming to the village. He returns to his existent lamentations. Carioli also broods by moonlight. His allies cheer him up though. They threaten to unionize. Lamis and Boxo reminisce. Some other girls show up to thank Boxo. Lamis is flustered. They make out. It's a little weird, but whatever. Boxo reflects on how cool it is to be an inanimate object. And that's the end of season one of Reborn as a Vending Machine. Hey, like and subscribe to help me make more videos. Uh, I have a Patreon if you feel like buying me food. Um, thanks for watching. Bye.